the closer was the second lecture. Thank you. So in this morning's uh, lecture, we uh, looked at the all possible Feynman integrals that can arise really in a general quantum field theory, although we're focused on um, the Feynman integrals that are relevant to doing uh, in gluon uh, computations. And uh, we've also introduced a tool which we've been already using, and we're going to use a little bit more of uh, the gram uh, determinant. So um, the set of integrals that you start with, and again, remember, we're, we're kind of doing this abstract uh, calculation. You can think of it in Feynman diagrams. You can just think about the path integral and all possible uh, loop integrals that can arise at uh, one loop. And that's the set that we're uh, funneling down. And um, along the way, I introduced some integrals that didn't actually arise that way. I wrote down things that, um, for example, were of this sort of uh, I6 of, of G1. So, of course, I'm free to consider Feynman integrals that didn't come from uh, a specific theory because I'm trying to build linear relations between integrals that did start from uh, a specific theory. I'm always willing to consider uh, things that are outside the set that are provided by the field theory uh, in order to then find uh, relations between things that are inside the field theory. And you'll see a much more extreme example of that uh, I assume when Professor Dewar kind of explains the traditional uh, approach to integration by parts, because that's also something where you throw in a huge number of integrals that never originated in a, in a field theory, uh, and then you do a lot of linear algebra to throw them out again. So this morning, we saw how to take this set of, of integrals where in, uh, for gluon amplitudes, m could go all the way up to n, the degree of the uh, polynomial of the numerator in L, and uh, where n goes up to the number of legs. If you're interested in calculating 2 to 15 scattering, then it would have 17 point functions, for example. So we saw how to take that set of integrals all the way down to integrals that have no more than four legs, and Correspondingly, uh, m, the, the degree for, uh, for gluonic amplitudes is again also going to be uh, less than or equal to, to 4 for the polynomial. And uh, we can actually simplify these integrals uh, further. And we can do that using uh, Lorentz invariance. Uh, this is usually called the passerino veltman decomposition. How many people here have heard those two words before? So I, I guess uh, the um, whoever taught you field theory has been under the shadow of uh, Tini Veltman uh, because, in fact, the basic idea, as far as I know, goes back to Brown and Feynman probably about uh, 30 years earlier than that. Anyway, so uh, probably should be called the Brown, Feynman, and Passerino Veltman decomposition. In any event, uh, the basic idea is to use uh, Lorentz invariance. So suppose you just have a scalar. Uh, I mean, a, a single uh, tensor integral. So the way we're doing it, we're actually thinking of this being contracted with some constant vector v, but you know, I can just differentiate that to expose the index again. And uh, so this is a parity invariant integral. It's Lorentz covariant. So we must be able to express it as a linear combination of things that have the right Lorentz transformation properties. The only things we have are the three independent uh, momentum. Of course, it's precisely the fact that we don't have, uh, at least at this stage, a fourth independent momentum is what prevents us from running the same kinds of arguments that we ran uh, earlier to get down to n equals 4. We can't keep uh, running, them, running them on. 
So now, what we really want to do is we want to we need to find these uh, coefficients, and uh, it's convenient uh, for that purpose to use a set of uh, conjugate uh, vectors. And um, how many people can guess what object I'm going to write down on the right hand side? Well, um, again, you can use the grand determinant to build these uh, conjugate vectors. You can, of course, just do Passerina Veltman, Brown Feynman, Passerina Veltman in the traditional way and just set up equations and solve for them. But you can write down the solutions by recognizing essentially the geometry of the problem. And um, so Q2 is equal to G124 and G4. Four. And finally, G4, G4, and um, G4, and G4. So again, there was a little bit of confusion in the morning as to what the notation meant. This notation I'll explain in a minute. Is it clear to everyone what the G124 means? Now's the time to ask. Huh? Okay. So um, the G mu uh, two four, for example. Well, we just want to expose the Lorentz index, so let's just uh, differentiate with respect to uh, something with a lower index. Uh, G of x two four one two four. So basically, you're just replacing uh, that thing with with uh, some abstract vector carrying uh, that index. And uh, these uh, conjugate vectors are, of course, designed so that um, they are uh, orthogonal to the uh, momentum. And uh, so, for example, you can see if I plug in, if I take q1.k4, for example, then I'm going to have k4 is going to appear twice. This row is linearly dependent, so that's going to vanish. In contrast, if I contract it with k1, then of course the two rows are the same. That's exactly what this means, so this will just cancel and I just get 1. And so now we can just write down a solution for these uh, coefficients in just in terms of, of the L dot pi. And, um, well, is, so I've taken something that's linear, I think something that's linear. How have I made progress here? Everything here, if I expand that grand determinant, it's in terms of L dot K1, L dot K2, or L dot K4. That I can re rerun through this, uh, this rewriting where I write the dot products in terms of differences of denominators plus some external invariance. So then I'm going to be able to write this ultimately in terms of triangles and scalar boxes. And you can do the same exercise uh, for things that have multiple tensors, so a two tensor, a three tensor, a four tensor. You can do the same exercise for uh, the triangles as well, the three point integrals, and uh, likewise for the bubbles. The only thing that you cannot do here is do anything uh, in, in four external dimensions to reduce the scalar box, the scalar triangle, or the scalar bubble. So those are really left at the end of the day as basic symbols. Yes? But it's still correctly, so now the k's are on shell. The k's are, the the k's are on shell. Off shell and no, I actually, I, the, the, the k's here could, could still have uh, k squared equals, equals not, not equal to zero. Because then I don't understand why we have just k1, k2, k4, and not the k3. I mean, well, I mean, the, these things still satisfy momentum conservation. So the k's here, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. the k's Wait, here, are not necessarily massless. They might be or they might not be. But they still satisfy momentum conservation. When every step when we were doing the reduction earlier, we never created an integral that violated momentum conservation. That we always preserved. The only thing that happened is sometimes when we omitted a propagator, we had two massless legs that now show up as a single leg of the diagram, and so it's of course massive. Mass is the dot product of the two original massless momentum. Yeah. Uh, why do we know that this integral is in the scattering plane? I'm sorry? Why do we know that this integral is in the scattering plane? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, this isn't a plane. These, these things actually map out a, 
a, a three-dimensional uh, volume. But yeah. the, the, it, it's actually an excellent question. And I, I almost, well, almost, your fellow students almost might think that I planted the question with you because I'm going to answer it by uh, showing you uh, the third vector. The, the, the reason that only these three can appear as opposed to the fourth vector is just uh, parity invariance, as you'll see in a minute. There's no, this has to be, this has to transform as a, uh, as a Lorentz vector. So I can write it, if I had four vectors, I could write it as coefficients in terms of those four vectors. The fourth vector will not be parity invariant, so it cannot show up here. This integral is parity invariant. If I do a parity transformation, nothing changes. And that's also valid for the d minus four dimensional. I'm sorry? That's also valid for the d minus four dimensional. Yeah, because the, the uh, I mean, the, 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 that thing doesn't, this, the four minus d dimensional part here, assuming epsilon is, is negative, has to has to vanish because there you can you can actually exchange it for minus itself and it doesn't change anything about the minimum. Right. So the, the maybe I, I should elaborate a little bit on that. So if we look at L squared, for example, let me label the, the four dimensional part by a bar and the um, d dimensional part by a mu squared. Well, I, don't, I mean, that mu squared should not be confused with this mu or anything. Let, let me call it, uh, well, I don't know, r squared. So this is the, the minus 2 epsilon dimensional components squared. So if I, if I take, uh, for example, L minus k1 squared, that thing is going to be L bar minus k1 squared, and then minus r squared again. So the only thing that shows up in that integral is, is r squared. So if I change L, the epsilon dimensional components, to minus themselves, this is the only thing that changes. So that part of the integral has to vanish. But those components have to vanish. The result has to vanish. OK, so as I said, um, that, that question was, was almost too well timed because um, there is actually a fourth vector that uh, we can write down, and we can write that down using the uh, levi civita symbol. So let me write it down. Uh, the sigma, a1 nu, a2 uh, lambda, a4 sigma. So this thing, because it involves an epsilon symbol, is necessarily uh, parity odd. You can see that just from changing the sign of, of all the vectors, the thing is going to change the sign. And um, it's, uh, it's clearly linearly independent of, of the three vectors there. So we could, in principle, add another component and try to solve for it, but we'll find that that's zero because of, of the variance of, of the integral. So the, the other thing that uh, another way of, uh, of phrasing that is that if we contract this with, uh, with L, and this, uh, this mutation, again, just means that the, all the indices are contracted. So again, this, this integral uh, will vanish. On the other hand, of course, as a, as a term before integration, uh, as part of the integram, the thing is non-vanishing. I mean, if I plug in some numerical value for k1, 2, and, and 4, then each of these components has some numerical value, which is in general not zero. So this thing cannot be expressed in terms of the denominators, and its integral is zero. That means that at the same time, it's, uh, it's our first example of what I mentioned earlier, an irreducible invariant, or an irreducible scalar product, as they're sometimes called. And it's also an example of a surface term, something that integrates to zero. Now, in one loop, you might think these examples are a little bit silly. And uh, you'd probably be right. But when you go to higher loops, there are examples, first of all, of things that are irreducible but not surface. And um, I suppose there are also examples of things that, um, no, I guess there are no surface terms that are not also at least partly built out of uh, irreducibles. And they're, in general, quite non-trivial. And that's what the whole uh, story of uh, integration by parts is about. There's one other, um, one other factor about this, uh, this extra 
the variant, which some people call omega. And uh, there's a certain sense in which even though omega itself is irreducible, omega squared, it's not exactly reducible, but it's in a certain sense reducible. So it's maybe I should say quasi-reducible. Um, and that's another exercise. So all of this stuff, of course, these exercises thus far are really just uh, algebra and kind of getting yourself familiar with uh, all of these uh, invariants. So uh, exercise five is uh, work out uh, omega squared. What is it? And there's actually a very simple way uh, to see uh, what that is. So sorry, I, when I say omega, actually, I should say this thing, uh, omega actually is, is this thing. So omega is epsilon mu nu lambda sigma L mu. So this thing dotted into L, L mu A2 lambda A4 sigma. Okay, so we have our basis set of integrals, which are the um, the, uh, the boxes, scalar boxes, triangles, and bubbles. Now, most of the uh, reduction terms, until we got to the five-point uh, integral, did not depend on epsilon. They didn't depend on the space-time dimension. Once we assumed that the external particles were all in four dimensions, the reductions that I, I showed you here, the uh, brown feynman passerino velpin ones, and the reduction of the uh, pentagon does depend on so our original amplitude, finally back to thinking about uh, color-ordered uh, amplitudes, is of course the sum of these uh, Feynman diagrams, all of the Feynman diagrams we started with, so the sum of endpoint amplitude. And then we perform our reduction, our reduction machinery on the, all the integrals that show up on the right-hand side. We're going to find some coefficients. We haven't really been keeping track of these coefficients because we didn't actually keep track of the original Feynman vertices. We're not actually going to be doing the, the calculation that way. But we know it's some rational function of uh, the invariance and, and of uh, epsilon, the uh, dimensional regulator. So we can write them in terms of these basis integrals, these boxes, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And, um, because we've combined external legs as we're pinching propagators, these boxes come in, a, in many different flavors. So if we're doing a four-point calculation, then we would just have a box with all the original four uh, external momenta, so they'd all be massless. I'm going to uh, sometimes use a, a pictorial notation where the massive external lines are denoted by double lines, and the massless external lines are denoted by uh, a single line. So we also have uh, what are called the one mass boxes. So this would be, for example, uh, if we had a five point function, it could be, for example, k1 plus k2, and this would be k3, k4, and k5. We'll come back to an example of this very specific integral of uh, later on. We have to consider things that could have, uh, for example, two external masses. This is called the easy uh, two-mass box. And uh, the one where there, there's a different topological configuration with two uh, adjacent uh, massive legs, which is called the uh, hard two-mass box. And uh, then three and uh, four mass boxes. And similarly, for the triangles, there can be one, two, or three mass triangles. In the bubble, of course, there's really only one kind of it as an integral uh, function. Uh, it has to have a massive uh, leg going in and, and uh, coming out. 
And of course, th these are the integral functions that arise, but the arguments for them can be, can be very different. So if we have some eight-point function, uh, for example, we might have an easy two-mass integral where this uh, leg is k1 plus k2. We also might have that same function, but with different arguments, k1 plus k2 plus k3. It all depends on how we wandered through the uh, reduction procedure that, uh, that I outlined. Now, something that I'm not going to uh, go through, but I'm just going to, to tell you is that you can simplify uh, this uh, expression a little bit, well, simplify from some points of view, and instead of writing it as a sum over the uh, basis integrals with an epsilon dependence in the coefficients, you can write it as a sum over the same set of basis integrals with coefficients that are independent of epsilon at the price of adding some additional rational terms that involve no integration, no integral function uh, at all, which I'll sometimes call C0. And um, the, this is what uh, we can call our, our master equation. So the amplitude can be expressed as a sum over the basis integrals with some coefficients and some perhaps additional rational function. And these things are both uh, rational functions of the spinner variables. The original set of lambda i and lambda tilde i, where i, of course, runs over all the particles in the original uh, momentum set. And, um, of course, the, uh, for example, from the point of view of the helicity, once you fix the helicity configuration of, uh, of the external legs, there's a certain phase that has to come along, a certain phase weight that uh, Professor Hen has explained. And every single coefficient here has to carry that uh, phase weight. The integrals themselves are purely functions of the Lorentz invariant, so they do not carry any helicity uh, information. So the, our task now, the next thing we want to do is ultimately to find uh, equations for these uh, coefficients and ultimately also for C0, but I'm not going to explain that in, uh, in detail. So we want to find uh, equations for these Cj in terms of quantities that we already know. And the quantities that we already know are going to be on-shell tree amplitudes. So, and that, that's essentially what generalized unitarity is going to do for us. It's going to set up equations that allow us to solve for these coefficients directly in terms of on-shell tree amplitudes, and uh, that without ever having to talk about uh, finite integrals, and that also means we don't have to worry about the details of the reduction coefficients. We just have to know that the reduction uh, was possible. Could you maybe repeat how the rational terms come about uh, from the left hand side? The well, sure. Um, the, so the integrals, uh, for example, have, uh, have poles in, uh, in epsilon. So they're terms that, let's say, go as, as uh, 1 over epsilon squared. And uh, these coefficients, because they depend, they're rational functions of, uh, of epsilon, if you expand them in epsilon, then they're going to have terms which are proportional to epsilon or epsilon squared. In fact, at the end of the day, you can interpret this as all being a cancellation of, of epsilon over epsilon. But uh, in any event, the, uh, we haven't really looked at these integral functions yet, and we'll come back to that in a little while. But what's going to happen is that there are going to be terms that are essentially rational inside the integrals divided by uh, powers of epsilon. When they meet an epsilon from the expansion of the coefficients, they're just going to leave a rational uh, thing, uh, rational thing left over, and that's going to be the source of these rational uh, terms. So before we actually launch into kind of finding an equation for, uh, uh, for this CI, I, I do want to take uh, a few minutes to explain kind of the conceptual underpinnings of unitarity. But before that, I'll answer why questions. Why the I'm, I'm sorry, I can't. Why the little tadpoles? Tadpoles. So um, that's a good question. And uh, that's one of the things that would be different if I had internal massless lines, then I would, in fact, have tadpoles. But um, tadpoles, if all the internal lines are massless, are scale-free integrals. And so in dimensional regularization, they actually vanish. It's a little bit sneaky, but. It's the way the world works. Yes? Uh, 
uh, why don't we have the d minus four dimension part of L squared as an insertion? Yeah. Um, we do, and <coughs> the uh, that uh, it's something that we don't um, have to treat separately up to this point. But in fact, it's those d uh, those epsilon dimensional terms that, in a certain sense, you can use to calculate the rational terms when you separate them out. And this separation of of kind of the epsilon dependence and the coefficients is, is in a sense related to those those dimensional terms. Any more questions? Okay, so let's uh, let's kind of take a, a very uh, kind of conceptual view of of how it is that we're going to be able to use analytic structure uh, to get at. Uh, of concrete results for the uh, for the amplitudes. So unitarity in its original form is a basic property of any quantum field theory. It just says that probability is conserved. So if we look at our S matrix, scattering matrix, it just tells us that S dagger S is uh, is equal to one. Of course, that also includes the the uninteresting part, the, the boring part, the forward scattering part. So if we separate out the, um, the transition matrix, we write it as S equals 1 plus IT, then we write out this equation, then we're going to find that the difference between T and T dagger can be expressed uh, the, as in terms of the, uh, the square of T, T dagger T. So in a certain sense, this you can read as being, and I put it in quotes, the imaginary part of some uh, matrix element is given by the square of the transition matrix between the same final and, uh, and initial states. So this is a relation that, at the very uh, basic level, links two orders in in, uh, in perturbation theory, this thing, of course, is starting from a tree-level amplitude, and uh, we're going to square it. This thing is uh, an imaginary part. It's, a, it's a, an absorptive uh, a contribution, and that's something which intrinsically starts at one loop. So we're, we're seeing that we can get <coughs> some information about one loop from knowing a tree-level amplitude uh, squared. And um, in the bad old days of uh, dispersion relations, long before even I started doing uh, physics, you could imagine, in a certain sense, uh, reconstructing the real part, or the uh, dispersive part, of an amplitude through uh, dispersion relations. So there's a principal value uh, prescription here. And this is just, uh, just reproducing the textbook formula here. So we have this imaginary part, and uh, which we might get, for example, from uh, the square of some tree-level amplitude. And then there's going to be some uh, additional quote subtraction, which is related to the ultraviolet behavior of, uh, of the theory. It's a subtraction constant. And secretly, what's going to happen in dimensional regularization is Morally speaking, at least, it's making everything ultraviolet convergent, so it's getting rid of the need for these unknown uh, subtraction. So in kind of the very crudest conceptual terms, you can imagine that you're starting, let's say, in the, in the uh, S plane, there's some, going to be some branch cut you know for physical regions, physical reasons starting uh, at S equals 0. As new channels open up, and what it's going to tell you is that all you know is that there's a discontinuity across that branch cut, suppose, of 2i pi, and from that you can actually deduce that the amplitude as a whole, because of, uh, for physical reasons, has to have a, uh, a logarithm in it. And here, we want to sort of t less than zero. So it may seem as though one is getting uh, something for, for nothing, but that's not actually true. It's kind of deep uh, physical principles that are, are, are doing that. So in the context of, uh, of Feynman integrals, then uh, this can be made a little bit more, uh, more concrete. 
And uh, let's, let's think you now for a second just about scalar integrals. Imagine we have some scalar field theory, so there's no momentum factors at the, at the vertices. And this is telling us that we have to focus on, on the branch lines, on the discontinuities in, in, in integral functions. And well, I mean, you've presumably seen enough of field theory to know that logarithms show up, so there are branch cuts, there are discontinuities across those branch cuts. So we're starting with a, um, a rational function. The integrand is a rational function. We're going to integrate over it, and we're going to produce uh, branch cuts. And where can the branch cuts actually start? Where can the, what can be associated with the branch cuts? So, and uh, the source, in fact, is going to be poles of the integrand. And those poles are ultimately going to be the sources of branch cuts once we've done the, uh, the integration. So let's imagine doing something which is uh, mathematically um, very naughty. And uh, let's imagine that we're going to try and take some discontinuity in some channel. We may not be too precise about that right now. And we have some Feynman integral. And then we have a bunch of properties. And uh, let's do something, as I say, mathematically very naughty, and imagine that we push the discontinuity operator through the integration and look at the discontinuities of the uh, Feynman propagators themselves. <coughs> well, if we have uh, the discontinuity of something that is a Feynman propagator, except I've relabeled uh, L squared as x, then we're going to have um, this result, we just have to subtract it above uh, the branch cut and below the branch cut, and this thing is going to be, this is the, uh, the Feynman I epsilon, don't confuse it with the epsilon of dimensional regularization, I am using a script epsilon here to make sure, so that uh, you track of the distinction. So if we now take uh, the epsilon goes to zero, that is the uh, Feynman I epsilon to zero, does anyone know what we get out of this formula? Hmm. Yes. A bunch of people knew. It's good. Learn something in the field theory course. So what's going to happen is that when we're looking for uh, discontinuities, of the resulting function, then heuristically speaking, um, we're actually going to be replacing the propagator with a delta function. In fact, it's, uh, it's an L squared here, and it's a delta of L squared, so it's actually an on shell delta function. So in, in the language of, uh, of cutting, we're going to cut that line, we cut the propagator, replace it by an on shell. Uh, delta function. Now it's possible to do this exercise much more carefully. It was done uh, a long time ago by a fellow named Dick Kutkuski in the 1960s. And you can in fact do the exercise for multi-loop integrals, but we only need them for uh, one-loop integrals. And so now the, what happens is, let's suppose we're taking the discontinuity in some channel uh, given by some invariant uh, k squared, and we have some number of legs that uh, isolate, in fact, uh, that uh, are carrying the sum of momentum as k. This could be just a lone Feynman integral, or it could actually be a lone uh, Feynman diagram. It doesn't really matter very much. What he tells us is that we should uh, cut both of the propagators that isolate uh, k, and uh, we write the sum over the intermediate states, which in fact is essentially um, a phase space integral. So we want to, in fact, at, at higher loops there would be a sum because there can be more than one cut that isolates uh, k. But at one loop, it's just one of it. And uh, so these are now tree objects, tree. Uh, diagrams. And in fact, uh, the right-hand side here is supposed to be conjugated, but it isn't actually going to matter for anything we say, so I'm not uh, in the sense of conjugating the 
a finding on an epsilon and changing the sign of the uh, numerators and propagators, but it doesn't actually matter. And um, so what that is going to do Uh, yeah, sure. It's a bit stiff here. That's good enough. Okay. So we're going to cut the two lines, the two propagators that isolate that uh, channel. And uh, in each cut, we're going to replace the propagator. And here, I'll uh, put in the mass just because that's traditional. And uh, we're going to replace it with a certain delta function. Let me explain write it down first and then uh, explain it. So it's a positive energy delta function. That's what the plus sign there means. So there's a, a theta function picking the positive energy solution to the delta function times an ordinary on shell uh, delta function. And uh, the net effect of, uh, of that delta function, if we go back to, doesn't really matter, um, too much, but let me just go back to four dimensions here uh, for a second. To, so this uh, thing is essentially the kind of uh, object we will get after doing this substitution. Of course, it's multiplied by some other function. Does uh, anyone know, recognize what this uh, measure is? You might have seen it in your field theory course. So this, uh, if you work out the delta functions, you discover that this thing is d3l. I didn't write down the detailed d dimensional coefficients, although you can do this for, uh, if this were d rather than 4 as well, this then becomes d minus 1. And uh, this, of course, is just the uh, Lorentz invariant phase space measure. So what's going to happen is the discontinuity is going to be related to a phase space integral over a product of two trees. So we start with the discontinuity of a one-loop integral, and we get the phase space integral of two, two trees. If we started with the discontinuity of an amplitude, the amplitude is just the sum of a whole bunch of, uh, of Feynman diagrams, then we're going to get the uh, phase space integral of, uh, of a product of two tree amplitudes. So the tree amplitudes, you've learned how to compute, for example, by BCFW or by any other uh, technique that appeals to you. In principle, once you integrate those over phase space, then you immediately know what the, the absorptive part of one loop amplitude is. So um, in principle, we can imagine taking our master equation. So let me write it out again. So our amplitude is equal to the sum over the basis Cj into J plus C0. And uh, we can apply the discontinuity operator in there's many different channels. The four point, there's the S channel, there's the T channel, five point amplitude, there's S12, S23, S34, so there's five different channels. So let's just pick some channel. Discontinuity in S1. I guess I should have left a little bit of space there. It is equal to the discontinuity in the same channel on the right hand side. Now, the uh, 
the CJ are rational functions of the external spinners, so there's no discontinuity there, they don't affect anything. Discontinuities come from things like logarithms, dialogarithms. How many people here know what a dialog is? How many people don't know what a dialog is? And there's a few people who are shy or uncertain. Okay. Um, so that's where discontinuities come from. They don't come from rational functions. So, and the discontinuities of these integrals, these are known functions. We can, there's a small set of them. We can just calculate them, and then we know what the discontinuities are. And the discontinuities of the amplitude are related to um, their phase space integrals of product of trees. Trees, essentially, for the purposes of this exercise, I treat as known because any given tree, I hand it to you in some amount of time later, ranging from a few minutes to maybe a few days, you come back with an answer. And then you can integrate it, and then you have some, you have some known thing here. You think just kind of using integrals are known, and the only unknowns are the CJs. Let's leave aside C0 for, for the moment. So that would set up a system of equations that, in principle, um, we, can, uh, we can solve. And um, the uh, just um, so, for example, in the case of the uh, of the four point, we would have uh, discontinuities that um, that arise from uh, from logarith logs of s and logs of t, and uh, of course the actual box function is actually of uh, what I call log squared class function. So it involves log squares of s and t and log s log t. And in principle, the more complicated ones uh, involve uh, the dialog. For the benefit of those who haven't seen the dialog before, I will uh, explain to you what it is in just a, in just a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, so when we take the discontinuity of a log squared, well, of course, that's going to produce a single log. It's, it's the reduction in, in order is a little bit what happens, like what happens in, in differentiation. So the discontinuity of the box, for example, so that the box starts out as log squared, the discontinuity is going to have, uh, in principle, both log s, log t, and also terms that have no log, if we started out with a term that was linear uh, in the logarithm. So there's going to be uh, three terms coming from discontinuity s, three terms coming from the discontinuity um, in, uh, in t, and uh, so, for example, we would get six different equations uh, for five unknowns in the four-point case. And uh, we would get uh, 30 equations for 20 unknowns in the five. So, we can actually do this. We have now, a, it's a linear system. It's linear in the coefficients. And we can just you know, solve this. It's just linear algebra at this point. We can solve it and uh, find the answers. So the question is, though, you might uh, wonder whether one can do a little bit better. Because uh, first of all, we have to do some phase space integrals. Um, we have this matrix of equations that everything, all the different coefficients are all jumbled up together. The question is, can one actually do better and isolate each of the coefficients? Can we pre-diagonalize the system? And uh, we can. And that's uh, the method known as generalized unitarity. But uh, before we uh, launch into that, then uh, just for the benefit of those who um, have not seen uh, dialogues before. So at one loop, basically, the the, the functions with discontinuities that you need to uh, consider are logarithms and so-called dialogs. When you go to two loops or higher loops, there's a much larger menagerie of functions, which again, you'll learn uh, something about in Professor Durer's uh, lectures. So a logarithm, we can imagine, let's say log x, we can write as, uh, as an integral, let's say from x to 1 of uh, of dt uh, over t. And um, it's, uh, it's convenient to, to kind of define the, uh, the weight one uh, dialog room, or the weight one polylog room, excuse me, uh, in terms of, uh, of a uh, logarithm. And the, um, 
And this actually starts a sequence. So this is just a, a relabeling of the logarithm. You can give an integral expression um, of that sort. And um, we can then define higher polylogarithms, higher classical polylogarithms, as simply the um, integral of a lower degree polylogarithm divided by t, dt over the, re the range from uh, 0 to x. And uh, the little n there is called by mathematicians the weight. So this is the weight of the uh, classical polylogarithm. And uh, physicists uh, call it, have been calling it transcendentality for a long time. And uh, I'm happy to report that that has now contaminated the mathematical community. There are at least some mathematicians that also use that, uh, that term. So at, uh, at one loop, in fact, all we'll need is, is n uh, equals 2. So we have the so-called dilogarithm. Uh, the classical polylogs date back to the uh, 19th century, and the dilog <coughs> date back to the 18th century. Um, and uh, we can write it uh, you know, as an integral using this, just transcribing this formula uh, directly. So we have to do t. And we can also write it in somewhat more uh, symmetric forms, where uh, write it as a double integral. Let's say x minus t, 1 minus v, where this is taking over the triangle where the sum of t and v has to be uh, less than x. So, let's, uh, let me give you a brief exercise just to, using counting, I think this is number six. Where's my exercise now? Is this number six? This is five. It's five? Three is one. Four and two. I thought I. Uh, I gave you the exercise in omega squared. Isn't that number five? All right, so there's some dispute. I found the one that the major squared is four. You counted uh, omega squared as number four, so this is number five. Okay. All right, so exercise five. Uh, what is the. Um, so, first of all, where is the uh, branch cut? of uh, Li2 of x, and uh, what is the discontinuity across it? Technology, as uh, as I've outlined it here, was in fact used to do a lot of calculations in the uh, 1990s. So this is already a, a practical uh, technology, and uh, early results in the literature more or less come from uh, from doing. It wasn't exactly phrased this way, but that's uh, that's essentially what it amounts to. But um, we can. Uh, we can do a little bit better. And um, the one thing that I, I just wanted to, to take a quick uh, interlude to uh, remind you of is the roles of, of, uh, of dimensional regularization. And uh, so, of course, it's, it's regulating the ultraviolet divergences, which are present and get absorbed into the definition of the coupling in the usual way. In field theory, what's maybe a little bit less usual is that typically the strategy is you compute an unnormalized uh, amplitude pretty much all the way to the end, and at the very end you simply substitute in the definition 
of the renormalized or physical uh, coupling. And because the structure of the beta function at one and two loops is, is very simple and, and not, there's really no scheme dependence and things like that, you don't really have to think uh, too much. Yes? Something there. Just uh, for the class, for the exercise for the students. Yes. In branch cuts, you can usually choose. So, uh, of course, we physicists always choose, let's say, the logarithm to have uh, the branch cut along the negative axis. Yes. So, yes. Well, I mean, you know, if, if you want it to be mathematically uh, very uh, careful, you can ask where are the two branch points? Branch points. Where are the two branch points of yes. the dialogue, excuse me? And what is the most obvious way to draw the branch cut between those two uh, branch points? And then, given that most obvious way to draw the uh, branch cut, what is the discontinuity across it? So, now I keep my more mathematical physics uh, supervisor is uh, happy. So, um, in addition to uh, UV, then it's, uh, I've already mentioned this, it's an infrared uh, regulator. And uh, these, are the, these are actually the, um, so I should actually write this as UV regulator rather than UV divergences. These are the ones that are actually technically more complicated, and if you're doing explicit uh, calculations in QCD, that's certainly where you'll be uh, investing a lot more energy than in the, in the UV. And uh, it's also a handle on the uh, rational terms, as, uh, as I've alluded to in, um, in a few comments uh, already. And uh, one of the things that uh, is worth mentioning here is that we think, and you've probably learned dimensional regularization is one regulator, but in fact that's not quite true once you're starting to talk about uh, spinning particles or supersymmetry or other things like that. There are actually a whole number of different variants of uh, dimensional regularization. They have to do with how uh, spinning particles are treated and how vectors are treated outside of, of four, four dimensions. The usual one is something known as a conventional dimensional reduction, uh, re regularization, excuse me, and that's something where everything, external and internal momenta, spins, everything, are just continued blindly into uh, D dimensions, and that's, of course, where when you have uh, parity-violating uh, interactions, you have to be very careful because what does gamma 5 mean and all this other sort of stuff. Um, the variants that are most likely to be used in the amplitudes community are actually things uh, known as dimensional reduction, which is a supersymmetry friendly version of uh, dimensional uh, regularization where you really compactify, you think of compactifying uh, epsilon dimensions rather than uh, doing a, an extension of, uh, of the momenta. And uh, there are other things which are essentially the Atuch Beltman uh, variants where you keep the external, or, or more generally, the observed momenta in four dimensions, and it's the unobserved momenta, things like the loop momenta, or unobserved momenta in some uh, phase space calculation, those you extend into uh, D dimensions. And uh, when you're doing a helicity, uh, helicity scheme, then not 100%, but a great deal of the problems or the com confusion about gamma five is, is actually eliminated because you're just thinking about the physical helicity states and you don't have to worry so much about the extension of, uh, of gamma five. So the, the, thing that, the, the thing that we're doing that you should always keep kind of in mind here is something uh, closer to the spirit of, of you know, pure Tuff Veltman or dimensional reduction for those of you who are familiar with it. And that again corresponds in, in the one loop amplitudes to keeping all the polarization vectors and all the external momenta uh, to be strictly in four dimensions. It's really only the loop momentum that is getting continued to, to do the dimension. So the, um, the, the unitarity in, in the form of the really taking discontinuities in different channels, what it boils down to, uh, in a sense, is looking at the at the integral or then looking at the amplitude and saying, let me identify all the contributions that have a selected pair of propagators. Because when I take a cut, when I take a discontinuity, I'm, I'm really picking out those specific pairs of propagators that isolate a given channel. And for whatever historical reason, um, you can think about isolating more than 
two propagators, and it's called generalized unitarity. I don't actually know that it has any connection to unitarity in the sense of conservation and probability, but I don't know if people were confused or they were ambitious or what, I don't know. In any event, that's what it's called. And uh, we can imagine, for example, acquiring three different propagators. So we have some contribution, and we're going to, to insist that three propagators are there. I'm going to label that as though we're cutting uh, these propagators. So for the moment, you can think of the cutting operation as replacing the propagators by this positive energy delta function. And some of you might be a little bit queasy when I'm doing this for more than two propagators. And you're absolutely right to be queasy. And we'll see, um, maybe today or more likely on uh, tomorrow, how to, um, how to give you the right medicine to uh, calm your queasiness, the ginger, for those of you who like ginger. So you can imagine uh, requiring that there be three propagators there. And if we look at some contribution, then all of a sudden, in this particular contribution, instead of having lots of possible triangles that can contribute, there's only one triangle. We pick out a specific triangle. We eliminate all bubbles. So you can see that we're simplifying the structure of, uh, of our equations. And we could go even, even more. We can go and require four propagators, for example. So let's imagine uh, looking at um, requiring cutting four propagators. So we have some number of external legs attached to each of these each of these uh, lines, and we cut four propagators. And um, so we don't need to go any further than that, because the most complicated integral we have on the right-hand side is, is a box integral. It only has four propagators. If we try to cut more than four propagators, well, I mean, OK, we, we would cut more than four on the right-hand side and more than four on the left-hand side, and we would get zero on the left-hand side, and we get zero on the right-hand side. And it's a true equation, but it's also useless. So we're not going to do that. So let's start by um, looking at, uh, the, at the so-called quadruple cut. We're going to cut four objects at the same time. And uh, it turns out that actually one of the, one of the virtues of, of making that transition to the uh, representation where there's no epsilon dependence in the coefficient, but there is an added rational term, is that this operation of cutting, we can actually do in, in four dimensions. So the integral may have started out as being divergent, but once we take this quadruple cut, what's left over is going to be perfectly well defined in four dimensions, so we can do that. And we'll be able to justify a posteriori, even if you don't buy that justification ahead of time. So, and also what's going to happen is, is we have four components then in d equals four for the loop momentum. And in a certain sense, we're imposing four conditions. So you can imagine you're solving exactly. So there's no integration left to do. So now instead of having to do a phase space integration on some tree objects and then use that as a coefficient in the matrix, we're just going to have get some coefficient, rational coefficient uh, directly. So, actually, I guess we will get to it today. So, actually, I should stop here and ask if there are any, are there any questions at this point. So, is the kind of the strategy at least clear? We have our master equation. We can express an arbitrary amplitude. And then now we're going to study the analytic properties on both sides of that equation and obtain some useful uh, equations for the coefficients. Yes? Is, is further cut still allowed to take some discontinuity? So we have some, um, if I do this integral, I will get a function who has branch cut? Yes. OK. So, so, you, so the, the answer is that this, this operation does not correspond to, or it doesn't always correspond to, to taking a discontinuity. It's probably not useful to think of it in that way. So if you actually took a discontinuity of an integral, let's say a box integral, then um, that object actually is really only defined on the real line. And so you can now analytically continue it, and then you could imagine taking some further discontinuity. But really, uh, you have to be a little bit careful about what region you're in. 
And uh, typically speaking, uh, if you're really trying to stay in a physical region, you can't take discontinuities and overlapping channels. It's not a, it just doesn't make any physical sense. So it's, it's better, I think, to think of this operation as being a different, a qualitatively different operation. But it's some operation that you're going to apply to both sides of the equation, and it's an operation that analyzes the analytic structure of both sides of the equation. So the prediction now amounts to residues or substitute directly? If, if you wait about, if you wait uh, oh, sometime between 15 minutes and, and 24 hours, we'll have an answer to that, that question. So let's write down, um, so let's write down an object which, as I discussed before, doesn't really exist, but it will, um, it will help us make further progress. So let's start with this integral. So this is a box integral. And actually, at the moment, I haven't uh, said whether the external lines are, are massive or massless, and you should keep an open mind on that. So let's kind of try to do the cutting naively, the way Kutkowski might have taught us in the, the 1960s. And um, we would get uh, d4l. Let me ignore the, actually the pi's uh, the pi's cancel out. We have delta plus of L squared, delta plus of L minus A1 squared, delta plus of L minus A2 squared, and delta plus of L minus A1 squared. So I just just mechanically taken the propagators and replaced them by positive energy delta functions, as uh, Kakeski would have taught us. And so as I, as I hinted, we have essentially four constraints. These delta functions want to pin the, that function down to some specific value or set of values. And uh, we have four degrees of freedom in the loop momentum, and we have four constraints. And so the question is, how many solutions uh, do we have? Does anyone have a guess? So, um, some people probably know the answer. If you actually know the answer, don't guess. That's cheating. Um, but if you don't know the answer, anyone want to guess? So it's four quadratic equations. And, and generally, actually, counting the number of simultaneous equations to higher order polynomial equations is a, is a very uh, tricky business. But uh, we can actually take linear combinations here. So that says we're trying to solve L squared equals 0. Let me take uh, the difference of these two. So then we would have, uh, for example, minus 2L dot K1 plus K1 squared equals 0. Again, I'm keeping an open mind as to uh, whether or not uh, K1 squared is, uh, and then again, taking more differences. I have k12 squared, which I could just call s, if I was so minded, 0. And finally, 2l dot k4 plus k4 squared, replacing k123 with k4 using momentum conservation. So now we have three linear equations and one quadratic equation. And so your guess might be that we have uh, two solutions. And that actually turns out to be true. So let's, uh, let's take a simple case where, in fact, our legs 1 and 4 are assumed to be you know, massless. It's easier to write down the solution then. And uh, let's write down the solutions uh, explicitly. So we're looking for something that's supposed to be uh, massless, and it has a certain, it's supposed to be uh, well, in a certain sense, collinear with both K1 and K4. Well, we, we know the perfect technology for uh, writing down uh, solutions of this sort. Let's write down an ansatz that is proportional to something built out of uh, a lambda spinner for particle 1 and a lambda tilde spinner for particle 4. Well, 
We know this is uh, an outer product of two spinners. They're associated with different legs, but who cares? So if we take the square of this thing, then you can easily demonstrate using the Peart's identity that it's going to vanish. So this equation is satisfied. If I dot it into K1, I'm going to get an angle product of 1 with 1, so it's going to vanish there. If I dot it into K4, I'm going to get an, a bracket product of 4 with itself, so that's also uh, going to vanish. So I've satisfied three out of the four equations, and I have one remaining degree of freedom in one equation. So I can now impose this equation. It's linear, so I'm obviously going to find a solution. I impose that third equation, and I now find a solution that uh, trading k12 squared for s12 has, uh, has this form. And again, just as a reminder, uh, this uh, spinner string uh, angle 1, 2, uh, bracket 4 is uh, just equal to the uh, product of spinner products if k2 squared were massless. And uh, if it isn't massless, then you could decompose it into massive momentum and be a sum over the, the product of those two things. Or you can just evaluate it as a spinner string if that if you're comfortable. Now, I started with lambda 1 and lambda tilde 4. I could have equally well started with lambda 4 and lambda tilde 1, so the spinner conjugated that object. So there's another uh, solution, um, which is very similar, but a conjugate. And there, again, that automatically satisfies the first, second, and last equation. And I can impose the third equation to find the value of C prime, and it is given just in terms of the conjugate, the spinner conjugate really of C, so S12 divided by the spinner uh, string 4 to C1. So, so that's very nice. We have four solutions, and we immediately see that there's a problem staring us in the face. So, and the problem is that that integral over the delta functions is going to give us zero. So what did you say four solutions? Yes, I said two solutions. Sorry, I misspoke. It should be two solutions. Yeah, but L and Z prime are the two solutions we were expecting. And in fact, those are the only two solutions. So the problem is that if we plug those solutions uh, back with L, essentially now the delta functions now try to say L for each of the components should be equal to the corresponding component of the, uh, the solution. And uh, the integral over L is then going to give 0. It's going to give 0 because these vectors are generically complex. They're not real. And the integral is over real momentum. It would be sort of a, a little bit analogous to doing the integral from 0 to 1 of dx of delta of x minus i, where i here is the square root of minus 1. So that doesn't mean that this result is wrong, um, but it means that uh, just as the trying to cut five propagators would have been useless, it's going to be useless. We're going to get zero on the right-hand side. We're going to get zero on the left-hand side. We're going to get zero equals zero. And it's very hard to extract anything uh, useful from, uh, from that uh, equation. And uh, rather than run over, I think it might be better. Or should I, should I run for another, go for another five plus minutes? Or should maybe let's. See, first of all, if there are no more questions, then maybe I'll go for a few more minutes. OK, let's, uh, let's keep on going. So how do we solve these problems? Well, of course, there was nothing that really obligated us to, to do cutting this particular way. We're not, doing, we're not just cutting in the sense of trying to find a discontinuity. We're looking for some operation which is analyzing the uh, the discontinuity, the analytic structure of the integral. And so what we want to do is redefine, we want to keep roughly the same spirit. We want to have a delta function, but we want to replace that delta plus 
with something that's more useful. And um, the way we do that is essentially by refine, redefining those delta functions as uh, contour integrals. So let's suppose we have uh, some polynomial. Let's just think about a single variable now. We have some polynomial, uh, which I'll call polynomial 2, that has a simple root at z0. So it's a polynomial with a single uh, variable z. And of course, that variable will start with it being real, but being polynomial, I freely extend it to the complex plane, so complex z. And it has a single root at z0. And the value, uh, and so it's a, a simple root, so that the derivative is non-vanishing there. And um, now let's let's look at a certain contour angle. I'm going to take a little circle that surrounds z zero, and um, we do the the contour integral around uh, d z. I probably want to derive two pi i here. And let's uh, integrate some polynomial 1 divided by polynomial 2 of z minus a. So this thing, of course, has a simple pole at, uh, at z equals z0. So this contour encloses a simple pole. So we know how to do uh, this kind of integral. And you can see that it's, it's kind of a toy model for for what uh, a generalization of our integral might look like. This is a, a denominator, which you know, we don't, could be quadratic in z, but just has a simple pole. And then there's some numerator which is modeling the, the numerators that we started out with in our, our integrals. Well, this contour integral, of course, we can uh, easily write down uh, the answer. It's just poly 1 of z0 divided by the derivative of the second polynomial at, um, at z0. And of course, because it's a simple pole, then this thing is well defined, and this thing is assumed to be well defined as well. So this is very much like a formula that you might write down if, uh, if you were doing, let's suppose you're doing some real integration over the variable z. And you're doing integrating polynomial 1, but you have another polynomial inside the delta function. So this is, this is something very similar to the, the kind of Kutkowski motivated integral that we, we just wrote down. If this were a delta plus instead of a delta, it would be kind of exactly the same thing. Now, if, if the, uh, let's say this is over some interval, and if the root is in that interval, then of course this thing is going to equal uh, poly 1 of z0 divided by the absolute value of poly 2 of z0. So these two formula are really very, very similar in, in, in spirit. The, the one difference, and it's actually a very critical difference, when you go on to, uh, to thinking about anything but the box integrals, there's no absolute value. So what we're going to do instead of using a, um, this kind of delta function, we're going to define a new delta function. We're going to define the result of this thing to be our contour integral. So we're going to define this to be the contour integral around the um, solution of the same function that's in the integral. And now, instead of the delta function, we're putting it in the, in the denominator. Now, this object is, of course, just in a single variable, so you're just working in the, in the complex plane. and. Uh, every, corresponds to everything you learned in complex analysis, I'm guessing probably in your second or possibly third year of, of university. What we're going to be doing, of course, is, is in higher dimensions. It's not just a single dimension. We have four components. So we're essentially extending the loop integral 
uh, to be in four complex dimensions. And so we're going to, to take uh, Minkowski space and extend it to four complex dimensions. That's where our integral is going to go. And uh, that's what our rule is for cutting. We're going to replace the, the contour originally runs along the, the real slice, so it's in the Minkowski slice of uh, C4. We're going to replace the original contour with one that uh, encircles the solutions, the common solutions to the delta function. These things are, are actually called um, a, uh, the, the common solutions here go under the name of a global fold. So, and the, the kinds of contours that we choose, it, in general, it can be quite tricky, but in this situation, we can just take a product of four circles in the four different dimensions. So we would have uh, you know, a C1, times uh, C2 times C. So just a product of, uh, of four circles in the four different dimensions. And that, if you take a product of two circles, it's maybe a little bit hard to envision in such high a dimension. But I think for two dimensions, you can do it. Then uh, you get a, a two torus. And this would correspond to a four torus. So we're encircling the global pole here by a four torus. And that's what we're going to do on both sides of the equations but at the risk of irritating the chairman a little bit more, I will actually stop here and uh, we'll go over this one more time uh, tomorrow and then proceed to derive some useful equations and do an example. So let me stop here. So, so we, we, we uh, well, actually, the, the, I don't want to take another half hour to explain what happens now. We'll have to wait until tomorrow. But, uh, but I'm glad that you're eager to, uh, to know the answer. The, I do want to correct one thing, though, about in the original equation, the only thing that was unknown were, were the rational coefficients. And they're inert to this process of taking the discontinuity. So, we, we ended up with a linear equation, it's a matrix equation, but it's a linear equation in the coefficients. So the, the vector of coefficients is multiplied by a certain matrix which we can calculate explicitly. And that matrix is then equal to something else which you can calculate explicitly from the known tree matrix. And then, then it's just linear algebra. Here, we're going to end up with a similar kind of structure, except that the matrix is, in a certain sense, going to be much closer to three diagonalized. So again, uh, yes, I think it was uh, straightforward uh, what the uh, procedure meant in both sides. And then you said you ran into a problem because you would get a delta function uh, that would uh, reduce, let's say, the integration variable uh, to an imaginary value of the, the, the complex plane while you're doing that, uh, like real yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would naively give you zero. Right. And this is why you right. need to right. further uh, elaborate. And, uh, Actually, I mean, the, the problem is it's, it's even, even before you think about the domain of integration. I mean, there's a positive energy condition. I mean, when, when the energy is complex, what is that supposed to mean? So that already makes you wonder, you know, what exactly are you doing? And the answer is that you really should be doing something a little bit different. Any other questions?
Okay, I guess like, are you allowed a coffee break? Or? Yes, we'll do a coffee break. Let's thank David again.